as we begin, I'd like to just start with a, maybe a, a, a thought-provoking question and ask you this. What was Jesus doing before the creation of the world? We know there was a time when God said, let there be light, and all creation came into being. My question is, what happened before that? What was Jesus doing? Any ideas? I, you won't get graded for right or wrong, but this, let's just uh, talk about it a little bit. Say again? He was moving the water. Okay, all right. Maybe even before there was water, what was he doing? In communion with the Father. That's a lovely thought. Wow. Okay, what else? Anything else? Preparing. preparing. Perhaps he was preparing. There was a lot of work to be done after all, right? How long does it take us to prepare anything? We have guests coming over. How long does it take us to prepare the house, prepare the meal, right? And he's preparing a whole world. All right. Can we play with that a little bit, Queen? Yeah, yeah let's play with that a little. You know, before the creation, how much time did he have to prepare? Eternity, right? He, had, he actually had quite a bit of time. And I'm going to use a symbol here that we often use for infinity. That's the symbol that, that's often used. So how long would it take to prepare the world? We, we don't really know. Could it have been a matter of months? I mean, years, months, days? We don't know. But let's say whatever. It, it took, let's say it took 315 of whatever that was. Years, millennia. Months, days, seconds, I don't know if it went quickly or, or slowly for him. But whatever it was, whatever unit you use, what do we get when we subtract that amount of time of preparation from infinity? What's, what's left? All right, good. We've got some mathematicians here. Okay, good. <laughs> We're still left with infinity. Now, we do know that he was doing things. In Ephesians 1, it says, before the creation of the world, before the foundation of the world, he chose us. So there were things he was doing. Queen's not wrong. But what I want to point out is that he's still left with a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> and how about you? Do you remember what it was like to be bored? Maybe for some of you that was a long, long time ago when you were kids, right? <laughs> I haven't been bored in a long time because I've always got too much to do. And I don't have enough time on my hands. But do you remember what it was like to be bored? And maybe you'd go talk to your mom and dad and say, I don't know what to do. I don't think God ever found himself in that situation saying, I don't know what to do. <laughs> because there was something that filled his time, but didn't just fill his time. It, you know what I'm getting at? And it relates to what you said, that he was having fellowship with the Father. Something very beautiful. And we, we get a clear indication of that when we look at John 1, verse 1. In the Bible, there are two uh, verses that speak very clearly about beginnings. And this, John 1.1, 1, 1, is one of those. Another, of course, is Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, where it talks about how God made the heavens and the earth, what I'm talking about. But which came first, John 1.1 1, 1, or Genesis 1.1? 1, 1? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the Bible, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 comes first. But in reality, in terms of our timeline, John 1.1 1, 1 is the first beginning. Both are beginnings, but John 1, 1, the first beginning. Because it speaks of the pre-beginning, the time before time. And it's a wonderful, wonderful passage. So let's, can we just say it together? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All right. Now, it's a, it's a very beautiful passage. And it speaks of fellowship. Maybe more so than we realize and so with a little help of, from some Greek, I'd like to just dig into this a little bit further. Because it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, we tend to overlook small verse, small words. But in this passage, a small world, word has great significance. And that word is with. The word in English, with, is, is not always necessarily translated from the same Greek word, but in this passage, this word with comes from the Greek word pros. All right, could you say that with me? Pros? Pros. 
This word intensifies our understanding of the meaning of the word with. When we talk about being with someone, we can be with them in many ways. We can just be with them hanging out in the room without any particular involvement, without any particular intention. But when we use the word pros, it intensifies the word and it means something like towards or focused on or fixated on or absorbed with. And so again, I'd just like to do a little demonstration. Bob, can you come on up here? It, it, it won't be embarrassing in any way, I promise you. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Well, oh, so you like to be embarrassed. Well, no. Not really. But all right. Okay. Are, 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 are we with one another? Are Bob and I with one another? Yeah. Are we pros one another? No. Because pros means orientation. Pros means towards. And we can be with one another, but not pros one another. And what I want to talk about is this prosness. This orientation where we are with one another, where there is a focus, a concentration, an involvement, uh, an interest, a fellowship. That's what pros is. Stay right here, Bob. I'm, I'm going to see if I've got a picture to show. Here we go. That's pros. What do you think those dogs are looking at? Any idea what they're... What they're yeah, okay, Bob says food. Yeah, that's a, real, that's a real good suggestion. My dogs are really pros. I have four dogs. And then when it comes to mealtime, they are very much pros their meal. Nothing will take their eyes off of it. Any other idea what they might be looking at? Squirrels. Squirrels, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certain kinds of dogs in particular really like squirrels. Yeah. Anybody else? Suggestions? Their master, someone said. Yeah, maybe they're looking at their master. Yeah. And isn't that a beautiful idea? All right. Okay, Bob, thanks. I may call on you again later, but thank you very much. So here's this beautiful picture of what Jesus was doing before the creation of the world. All right. Let me again just give you the backdrop. We have this beautiful picture of John 1.1, 1, 1, how in the beginning the word is with God, pros God, and the word was God. And, and to help you grab this with another picture, in Proverbs 8, there is a description of, a, of, a, of wisdom. But this is wisdom personified, and I have a sense that this wisdom is, is, is Jesus. It describes the initial creation event and how God is making everything. And in verse 30 of chapter 8 in Proverbs, it says, Then I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. Now, I love this picture of wisdom, personified Christ, rejoicing at his side. And in another scripture, you can almost say, dancing in delight. And there's this, this beautiful sense of their interaction. They're rejoicing in each other. No sense of boredom, no sense of aloofness, no sense of apathy, just a, 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 a tremendous enjoyment of being together. So now we're looking at what happens next. The father sends his son to earth and says, I've got work for you to do there. Does it change this fellowship in any way? That's what we're looking at by the examination of these passages. So let me hear from you. What did you discover in the Gospel of John? So give me your observations, first of all. All right, you're, you're, you're pointing out some very helpful things. Um, and let me contrast in particular two things. First of all, the Father is the source of everything that he does. Right. That's what you were getting at, Connie. That's what you were getting at, Becky. He's always looking to the Father. So there's that same absorption. He's looking to the Father. It's very present tense. It's not, oh, I looked at the Father once. I heard from him once. Now I'm going on memory recall. No, there's an ongoing connection with the Father that he's listening in the present tense. He's watching in the present tense. So he knows what to say. He knows what to do. So he is the source. The Father is the source. And he's, as Keisha said, he is depending. Jesus is depending on the Father for everything. And this is the source of his obedience. His utter reliance on the Father for everything. So first of all, the Father is the source. And Jesus, centered on him, is able to bring forth everything that the Father 
wants to bring forth. But secondly, he's the end. He's the, he's the end result. And it's towards his glory that Jesus speaks, acts, decides. Yes, there's not a total connection, nothing to break that connection at all. No interference, no barricade. Isn't it beautiful? Let's take, let's just look at these passages real quickly, one at a time, because I'd like to maybe show you um, some of the connections, not just what we see in them individually, but just some of the connections. So if you would, let's look together, first of all, at John 5, 19 to 20. And uh, I, I ended up putting John 5.30 down here at the end. I broke them up differently than what you see in your book. But uh, let's look at those together. And I was in Proverbs, so I'm turning back to John 5 now, where we read in verse 19 and 20. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. Let's just stop there. Uh, I find this to be an utterly staggering statement when you consider it was made by the son of God. When he would say, the son referring to himself, can do nothing by himself. You know, it's our goal when we have children to get them to do some things by themselves, right? Initially, our children can't feed themselves, right? Our babies can't feed themselves. They, they, and our goal, though, is that they'd be able to feed themselves. And Jesus says, I, I can't do anything by myself. What is he, a baby? <laughs> this sounds like a statement of failure. But it's not at all a statement of failure. It's a statement of leadership. Can I put that before you as leadership? that this is leadership to be utterly dependent upon the source of all wisdom, strength, all insight, all knowledge, all love, all forgiveness, all mercy. Leadership is not doing things by yourself. Leadership is doing things by God's strength. Let's turn that around. Instead of thinking that, oh, that, you can't do anything by yourself? What a baby. I mean, babies can feed themselves. You can, tie, you can clothe yourself, can't you? We measure our, project, our, our progression of maturity by what we can do for ourselves. Isn't that how we tend to look at maturity? And when you can do more for yourself, well, you're deemed to be more mature. But let's turn that on its head and looking at Jesus, who is supposedly he would be the most mature of all individuals, and he says, I can do nothing by myself. And yet he was the greatest leader of all. What is he saying? He, I'll finish this sentence, he can only do what he sees the Father doing. So here's our idea of pros again coming through. That we know, based on what he's saying, that his eye, can I draw an eye here? His eye is pros the Father. His eye is pros the Father. He's watching everything the Father is doing. He, it's present tense. He doesn't take his eye off the Father. And as he watches what the Father is doing, he does what he sees the Father doing. So there's utter dependency, utter reliance on the Father. And it's only possible because there is an unbroken connection. Now, if he does break connection, well, then he no longer knows what the Father is doing. He can't see. And so therefore, he can't do. So the connection is this proseness unending connection, unending fellowship. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. It's amazing, isn't it? Okay, let's turn to the next passage, John 14, John 7, excuse me, 14 and 16 and look at it with the same way. Here we read that not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? That's an interesting thing. You know, they recognize that he did not go through the rabbinical schools. That's what that means. That, that word he had not studied without being, having studied is kind of a code for he didn't go through the rabbinical system. He didn't have his master divinity degree. And yet, how did he know so much? How did this man get such learning without having studied? Isn't that interesting? You can have learning without studying. 
and you can study without learning. <laughs> Whoops. So Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. Again, he doesn't take credit, does he? My teaching is not my own. It comes from, here's the idea of source. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So here's the same idea of source. Jesus is saying, this teaching, what you're hearing, these words that come from my mouth, don't emanate from me as much as they emanate from the Father. And we'll see this idea strengthened in the next passage. Chapter 8, 26 to 29. Here the Jews are asking, who are you? And Jesus replies, just what I've been claiming all along. So verse 26, where we pick up, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable. Isn't it interesting? He's not saying I'm reliable. He's saying the one who sent me is reliable. And because the Father is reliable, Jesus is reliable by extension because Jesus is connected with the Father. So what I have heard from him, I tell the word. Again, here this is the picture of pros. Jesus' ear is pros, the Father. He's listening. What's the Father saying? That's what I want to tell the world. If the Father says it, I want to speak it. Let me go back to that. He said, So Jesus said, when you have, they did not understand he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, that I do nothing on my own. There's a second statement of utter dependency. I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. But here's this idea now of, of speaking that's based on listening. He can speak what the Father says because he's listening. He can do what the Father does because he's watching. Because he's watching the Father, he can do the work. Let me write that in another color, I think. Because he's watching the Father, he can do the work of the Father. Because he's listening... He can speak the words of the Father. Okay? Now, I'm going to jump ahead to uh, verse, chapter 14, verses 7 and 10. And let's look at that one. So here's that wonderful passage where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But uh, in chapter 14, the disciples are saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going. When you talk about having prepared a place for us with many rooms, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus replies, if you really knew me, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. To know me is to know him. And he explains how that can be because I and the Father are one. And he says, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. To see me is to see the Father. But Philip can't, can't, can't quite grasp it. So he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Philip says, show us the Father. And Jesus says, don't you know me? Can you imagine how confusing that was for Philip? Don't you know me? Even after I have been among you such a long time? How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is trying to say, I and the Father are one. To know me is to know the Father. To encounter me is to encounter the Father. To see me is to see the Father. And he speaks of his oneness, his union with the Father. Now, in verse 10, he goes on to explain, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who does his work. So this passage, verse chapter 14, 10, picks up both these ideas. It's the Father in me doing his work. It's the Father in me. These words you hear are not just my own. It's the Father living in me. 
All right, let's look at the next passage. Again, I pulled this out from chapter 5, so let's go back to chapter 5, in particular verse 30 this time. It gives us just another different nuance to this understanding of Jesus' fellowship with the Father. There we read, By myself I can do nothing. This is the third time. I wanted you to see this. Three times Jesus makes this amazing statement of dependency. You know, I would not stand before any group, never mind my detractors, and say, I can't do anything. <laughs> now, what kind of confidence would you have if I stood before you on the first night and said, uh, you're here for a leadership training seminar, and I just want to start by saying I can't do anything. <laughs> you probably wouldn't stay around. Why do we need to hear from somebody that can't do anything? I can't do anything. Why do I need to listen to you? You can't do anything either. And yet Jesus doesn't just say it once. He says it three times, and he says it in the ears of his detractors. I can do nothing on my own. Do you think he's trying to make a point for us? Now, does this mean that Jesus is non-productive? Does this mean he's unreliable? Does this mean he's irresponsible? No, that's not the idea at all. The issue is that he shifted the responsibility off his own shoulders to the Father. And this means that instead of looking to his own strength for ability, he looks to the Father. And what I find so fascinating about this is, is that he is not trying to be creative. He's not trying to be innovative. And you know, those are two really big words in, in business leadership, innovation. Would you agree? Innovation is a big word. In fact, I love to be creative and I love to innovate. In fact, supposedly it's supposed to be one of my gifts, innovation. And yet, I don't see Jesus in the pursuit of innovation. Instead, what do I see Jesus doing? He's in the pursuit of a relationship and fellowship with the innovator. Do you see what I'm saying? Now you may say, ah, you're just, you're just, ah, you're just playing with words. No, I think there's, a, there's not just a subtle distinction, I think there's a fundamental distinction. Is that question is, where do you look for your strength? Where do you look for your ideas? Do you look to yourself or do you look to another? And is that other God who created you? Now, I believe there's a tremendous need for innovation and creativity in the church. There's a tremendous need for innovation and creativity in leadership. But what I'm trying to call us to question is, where do we look for that innovation? And when, if we want to follow the example of Jesus, where did he look? He looked to the Father. And three times he admitted, without embarrassment of any kind, I can do nothing on my own. Staggering. But we know that he did so much when he was here. Now, what is this last thing? Verse 30 again, chapter 5. I can do nothing. By myself, I can do nothing. And then he says, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Again, this is all about the source. Who sent me? The Father sent me. I'm not here to please myself. It's not, as Catholics say, it's not for his glory, but it's for the Father's glory. So we see both source and end here in this passage that he's saying, I, I'm not doing it on my own. And what is the doing? Here the doing is judging. Here his activity is, is judging, discerning, um, deciding. So I'm going to draw another image for you. And you tell me if you can figure out what this is. What's that look like? A brain. Okay, good. All right. So <laughs> we know the scripture says that his mind, he, he, had, he was one mind with the Father. We talk about having the mind of Christ. This is that idea. Jesus had the same mind as the Father. His mind was pros, the Father. And because of that, he did the will. He did the will of the Father. So I want you to see this, that Jesus was not in any way ineffective. He was powerfully effective as a leader. But where did that come from? It came from his utter intimacy and dependency on the Father. And because of that, he could do the work of the Father. He could speak the words of the Father and fulfill the will of the Father. Now, isn't that what we desire as leaders? Isn't that what we desire? For those of you that have ministries where you preach or teach the word of God or maybe counsel or consult, isn't that our desire? 
When people come to us with questions, very difficult situations, whether they're family issues or issues related to the body of Christ, where they need discernment, they need understanding. Or when we want to speak a word to uplift, to exhort, to convict, to comfort. Or we want to do works that will actually change people's lives. Where do we find such works? You know, I know many times, I, since I have not only been a petroleum geologist, but a pastor uh, in my second career, I know what it's like to stand in front of people and to preach and to have that sense, I don't think anything happened. <laughs> I don't see any changes. Do you know what I mean? How many of you in speaking ministries know what I'm talking about? So how many times do you get up in front of people and you speak and you realize, oh, well, that didn't do anything. <laughs> Now, sure, there's a time element, and maybe we don't realize that more has happened than we realized. But we also know what it is to speak a word that just falls flat. So where does that word come from that, like a sword of the Spirit, divides soul and spirit, joint and marrow? Isn't that what the book of Hebrews talks about? That the word of God is like a sword of spirit, just going straight to the heart. Where does that word come from? Let me ask you. Where does that word come from? From the Father. If we're going to understand anything at all from Jesus, those words that cut to the heart to bring healing or conviction, they don't come from our ingenuity. They come from the Father. And they come from the Father because we're pros. The ability to do, the ability to speak, the ability to discern, to do, to speak, to discern, they don't come from here they come from Christ in you. They come from being pros, attentive to what God is doing in our midst. Watching, listening, being one mind with God. I think of an example um, of Jesus doing this in the scriptures. And it's a familiar story. You recall how on one occasion more than one occasion, but one particular occasion, the Pharisees sought to test him, eh, more to test him than to expose him as a fake. And so they brought to him a woman caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus' first response is very interesting to me. What does he do? Do you remember what his first response is? Yeah, yeah. Jackie's saying it. He, 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 he kneels, I imagine he's kneeling down. I don't think he's lying down, but I imagine he's kneeling down. He gets in proximity with the ground so that he can write in the dust. Now, is he writing? We don't know exactly. There's lots of conjecture about what was taking place. I'm not here going to solve that mystery right now, so I'll just add my conjecture to everyone else. But some say, was he writing down the sins that had been committed by the crowd who came ready to stone the woman? Or did he write down their very names? Or did he write down the names of their girlfriends? <laughs> what did he write? I don't know. But you know what I think? Let me add another little wrinkle to this. You know what I think? I think he was actually doodling in the dust because he needed time to be pros. And so I have a sense that he was saying, Father, as he doodled, you see the trap they've laid for me? You see how they think I can't really speak the situation without exposing myself. For if I say, condemn her, I'll lose popularity with the crowds and they'll, they'll go away thinking that I'm merciless. But if I say, let her go free, they'll condemn me for not following the law of Moses. And either way, I'm doomed. You see that trap, Father. But for, I, for you, I know there's no trap. So I pray, Lord, that you give me the words, that you give me the discernment so that I know what to do. What's your work here, Father? What are you doing here? What are you saying here? Give me your wisdom. And so after a little time of doodling, he stands up and, and we hear those marvelous words. Whoever was without sin, let him cast the first stone. And in that remark, we know that the wiser among them first dropped their stones and left the scene. That word went straight to the heart until eventually the scene now is empty 
And Jesus is left standing alone with the woman to whom he turns and says, where are they who would condemn you? And she replies, there is no one, sir. One little statement. And now he turns to her again and says, go and sin no more. Where does this word come from? Only the Father. The very word that's needed. And so that in the end, those who sought to trap him fell into their own trap (laughs) and found themselves speechless to his questions. This is leadership. This is leadership based on intimacy with the Father and dependency on the Father. Two key issues. Intimacy based, excuse me, dependency based on intimacy. The very kind of relationship, the very kind of fellowship that we ourselves are called to participate in. This same person, Jesus, then when he teaches his disciples, invites them into this kind of prosness. Now, I know I'm using the language wrong, but I think you follow what I mean. He invites us into that same relationship with himself to be towards him, the Christ, in the same way he was towards the Father. And we see this expressly, clearly laid out for us again in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Let's take a look at that. Again, a very familiar passage for us in which Jesus gives us a a picture. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be ever more fruitful. Skipping verse 3 and going to verses, verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. There's that same sense of dependency, right? It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, let me ask you this. In this chapter, John 15, what is the command that Jesus gives his his disciples? Remain. Does he command them to bear fruit? Does he command them to bear fruit? Look for it. Is it there? Actually not. Nowhere does Jesus have to say bear fruit. And why not? Exactly. We, we have an if-then clause. If you remain, then you will bear fruit. It's a consequence of abiding. Just as for Jesus, leadership was a consequence of his abiding in the Father. Wisdom was a consequence of his abiding with the Father. The words to speak were a consequence of his abiding with the Father. The work, his activity, his deeds were a consequence of his abiding in the Father. In the same way, bearing fruit for us is a consequence of our abiding in the vine abiding in Jesus. Isn't it beautiful to know? And doesn't it release us from all kinds of anxiety about, oh my, what what, what will my life produce? What will I account for? It really does reduce that sense of anxiety and our own self-focus because we are called, first and foremost, to abide. And out of that abiding, out of that prosness, same idea, comes all kinds of wonderful fruit. Jesus goes on to make this especially clear in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So now again, he reaffirms what he said earlier. By abiding with him, we will bear much fruit. But then he says the converse. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So let me ask a silly question. What does nothing mean? You know, I would like to play with this again, because actually it's a deeper question than at first it appears. What does nothing mean? Nada, zero. Nada, zero. Zilch. Nothing. Okay, let's, let's just first of all grapple with the completeness of this. 
w- would you be willing to say this? Apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. Can you say that? Apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. How does that sit with you? I wanted you to say it because I wanted you to feel it. How does it sit with you? Does your, does your flesh rise up against that? I, I, you know what? I, I don't know that it sets well with me. You know? Because I actually think that I can produce not only a few things, but quite a lot and of great value. How does it sit with you to say that? Because if it doesn't sit well, then the whole life of Christ is not going to sit well. And leadership is always going to be hard for you because you're going to be turning to yourself as a source instead of to Jesus. It takes a long time for our flesh to get used to this idea, doesn't it? It's a process. It is. All right. Now I want to go a little deeper, though. Look at the world around you. There's lots of non-Christians. Would you say that they have produced nothing? Have they produced nothing? Do you, know you know what I'm getting at? We have bridges. We have libraries. We have universities. We have roads. We have skyrockets that have taken a man to the moon. So I want to ask you again, what does nothing mean? Because surely the world has produced something. So what does nothing mean? Nothing of eternal value. Okay, say it again louder. Nothing of eternal value. Okay, everything I'm talking about is going to be gone. So you're suggesting that what Jesus really means is that nothing is nothing of eternal value. You know, there's that wonderful passage where Paul writes to the Corinthians that says at the end of time, our work will be tested. What is gold and silver will be refined, but what is wood, hay, and stubble will be consumed and revealed for what it is. And I think this is a hint of what Jesus is saying here. Because there will come a time when our work will be tested. Our, the fruit of our lives will be tested to see, is it something of lasting value? Will it bear the test of time? And will it go on to eternity? This is what Jesus is saying. And I think that within us, God has put this deep desire to produce work that lasts, to produce fruit that lasts. Fruit is perishable, isn't it? Fruit is very perishable. If you don't put it in the refrigerator, you know, it, it can get moldy so fast. In the same way, work produced apart from Christ is perishable. And if we want to produce work that lasts, we want to produce fruit that lasts, it needs, first of all, to come from him. He needs to be the source, and he needs to be the end. The same thing for Jesus. He needs to be both source and end. We do it from him and to his glory. Amen? I want to look at a story from the Bible, from the Old Testament, and, and just examine this concept just a little bit more. What does it mean when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And you remember the story of Abram and Sarai who were promised, it was a wonderful promise of God that that Abram would be the father, not only of children, but of nations. And when, of course, Sarah heard that promise repeated on one occasion, she laughed because it was so ludicrous. Because they were advanced in age. They were already in their 90s. And it was ridiculous to consider that her womb would produce the fruit of a life. And so she laughed. It was laughable. I don't know about you, but maybe sometimes you look at your life and maybe you think it's laughable to imagine that I'm going to produce something that matters. You know? I want you to think of Sarah. Now, the promise was wonderful but the waiting time was not wonderful. (laughs) They waited, they waited, they waited, and still no fruit of their womb, of her womb, no fruit of their life. And they waited and they waited until they thought, well, well, maybe we've got to do something for ourselves. And what happens? We know, we start out knowing that it's only through God But then after we wait and wait and wait, we take matters into our own hands again. And Sarah came up with a bright idea. She said to her husband, Oh, maybe it's perhaps through my handmaiden that God desires to fulfill this promise. So my husband, Abram, why don't you sleep with Hagar? And Abraham said, Wow, that's a great idea. (laughs) 
and they slept together and they produced fruit. And what was the fruit? The name of the fruit was Ishmael. Was this the fruit the father desired to produce? No. Was this the child of the promise? No. And yet God had a promise even for Ishmael. This is what's interesting. Even though this was not God's design, God's desire, God still had a promise for Ishmael. Now later we know that Abraham and Sarah did produce the fruit that God desired. And another child was born with the name Isaac. Thirteen years after Ishmael was born, Isaac was born. Now, what was the relationship between the two boys? Do you recall? Not very good. It was rather contentious, was it not? They were always butting heads. They were, they were very different. And there was just tremendous contention. They were, they were at war with one another. Now, and when did that relationship resolve? Never. What do you mean never? It's still going out. Explain. Okay. All right. So the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac, the Jewish people, and what we think of as the Arab people or the Muslim people, are continuing in war with one another. All because Abraham and Sarah had a bright idea. If only they had done nothing. Think about it. Nothing would have been preferable. And yet for us as people, we hate inactivity. We hate passivity. We hate to do nothing because we feel like I'm not being productive. But if only Abram and Sarah had done nothing, we would be better off today. But because they did something rather than nothing, we now live in a world of terrorism. We now live in a world marked by a war between the descendants of these two great men. If only they had done nothing. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me. And you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, let me acknowledge, this sounds like a very elementary teaching. Does it not? You might be listening and saying, we've heard this before. Thank you very much. What's new? Yeah, I agree. It's a very foundational teaching in the Christian church. But you know what I found? I found that those who would be leaders or those who are leaders are the ones that have the biggest problem with this. Now why? Why? It's because leaders who have enormous amounts of experience, who have enormous amount of training, get to the point where they can depend on their training, they can depend on their experience. And they very gradually, often very subtly, stop depending on Jesus because they have so many other things they can depend on. Well, last time we did it, it worked really well when we did it this way. Well, who are they depending on now? They're depending on their experience. Well, you know, in seminary, they taught me how to do it this way. What are we depending on now? We're depending on our training. What did Jesus say? I can do nothing. What were the Jews amazed at? How did this man get so much learning without having studied. Now, I'm not against study. I have, I have a library full of books. I love books. I love to study. But what I'm saying is that the study must be subservient to the Son. And that we depend first on Jesus, the Son of God. And after that, we ask we depend on our study. We depend on our experience. Our experience is not lost. Experience is very valuable. But do you remember how God directed Joshua to take the cities when he entered the promised land? The first city took it in a most improbable fashion. Oh, here's a great battle plan for you, Joshua. Take the armies, march around the city, you know, and at last time, you know, make a big shout. 
Uh, is there another battle plan? Is there, you know? And because that worked so wonderfully the first time, don't you know they were tempted? Let's do it again now, the next city. And this time God says, no, we're going to do it a different way. Wait till you hear the sound of the armies marching in the trees. He gives them a different plan. It would be so easy to depend on our experience and say, it worked well this way last time. Let's do it again. But the dependency says, no, go to him again. It's present tense, isn't it? Each time turning to Jesus. This is the source of leadership, the same as it was for Jesus. Always our eyes are on the Lord. Our ears are tuned to him. If we want to do the work of God, we need to be watching him. Present tense. Not remembering what it was like when we saw him once in the word revealed. If we want to speak the words of God, our ears need to be continually tuned to God. Not remembering again what he spoke to us a year ago. If we want to have a discernment, when we want to have the wisdom of God, to do the will of God, then we need to be connected with him. We need to be in fellowship with him. A fellowship that is based on an intimate relationship, a relationship developed over time. We can't microwave this relationship. It's a crockpot relationship. It's a relationship that begins and deepens, is enriched day by day. And from day to day, we may, may not see any difference in our intimacy, in our dependency. But day by day, layers of intimacy, day, layers of trust are built up as we soak up his love, as we soak up his grace, as we soak up his mercy. And then when we find ourselves in that time of trial, that time of testing, whether it comes from our detractors or from the enemy himself, we find ourselves in that place of testing and we do what we do best. We doodle. Some of us drool, I know, but, uh, <laughs> but we pause. That's what I mean by doodle. We pause. We look. What's the Father doing? We listen. What's the Father saying? I want one mind. I want the mind of Christ. And then we arise. We arise from our own difficulty, we arise from the ashes of our destruction, and then we find that we too speak that word that, like a sword, goes directly to the heart. And people, found, people find counsel. They find conviction, correction. They find God. Amen? They find a leader. Because here is one who is intimate and dependent on God. Amen? Is that what you desire? I'd like to stop right here. I have a sense that the Spirit is touching you, in, maybe in some unique way, calling you, calling you back to Him, calling you to repentance, I don't know what. But I'd like each of us to respond in our own way. And uh, you may not do this normally, but let's each just pray. You'll hear voices layering over voices. But let's just pray. What is your heart's desire? What business do you need to transact with him? I know from myself, when I, when I hear this teaching, when I even teach this teaching, what comes back to me is a, is a sense of repentance. Because I look back on my ministry, you know what I see? I see a lot of Ishmael's. Because I've had a lot of bright ideas in my ministry. <laughs> and so sadly those bright ideas that were not God's ideas have made more trouble than they've brought help. And only if I'd done nothing. Now, you may have, be hearing an entirely different word here today. But for me, that's, that's where this conviction comes in. And I say to God, teach me in a new way to depend on you because I don't want to produce any fruit other than the fruit that you desire to bring through my life. Amen? So let's go to God, each in our own way. Can we lift up our voices and pray? So Lord, we ask your forgiveness for ever venturing forth on our own. Depending, instead of, depending on you, depending on training, depending on experience, depending on things that are not eternal and producing fruit that is not eternal. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. 
for the Ishmaels that we ourselves have created. How glad we are to know that even though you don't call forth a life or a project, that you can still use it. But Lord, forgive us for thinking that somehow our ideas were brighter than your ideas. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for not waiting in those times when you wanted to teach us. Lord, draw us into new relation. Draw us into new understanding of who you are and what it means to live pros you. Bring us into intimacy. Bring us into relationship. Bring us into fellowship with you in such a way that our lives will bear fruit, fruit that lasts. Lord, I pray for renewal for those whose faith has gotten dry. I pray for renewal, a move of your spirit to refresh us, to renew us, to reinvigorate our faith. And I pray especially for leaders with great experience, for those here who have lots of experience to draw on, lots of training to draw on, so that they've been tempted instead to draw on those things rather than draw on you. I pray, O oh Lord, for us that we too would be renewed and reinvigorated and that the joy of the Lord would be our strength, that we would look to you for everything and that we would be able to make that same statement that Jesus made three times apart from him I can do nothing Lord may that not be a statement of defeat but that may may that be a statement of triumph thank you Jesus for your grace that you never leave us or forsake us and thank you, Lord, that you give more, not less, than we ask or imagine. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.